Hey, Gabriel Blake. Hey, Gabriel Jose. Where are we today? I'm in San Francisco. You don't sound too excited about that. I just got back from vacation. I don't want to be here, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I forgot to watch you. How was the tender one? But... It was rough. It was rough coming back <laughs> from luxury, but whatever. <laughs> for clean <laughs> uh, I guess that everything has its own type of, uh, of charm uh, and I'm still in Chicago like just basically sweating my ass off and you've actually moved apartments since the last time we recorded so you're in yeah. a brand new location <laughs> yeah brand new location two blocks away from my old new location uh, but yeah no moving is exciting it's like I think that everyone should do it every 12 months Yep, That's just a way of spreading the pain. It's one of your major hobbies, it's just moving. It is. Uh, but talking about exactly the opposite of hating, what did we watch this time? This was your pick, and you picked, actually, I argue it's a double feature. You argue that it's a single film, but we watched 2003's Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2004's Kill Bill Volume 2. Mm -hmm. And this was actually, uh, how do you say, designed as a single movie, but it was like the studios that they told Tarantino that it's like, there is no way that you're going to be like putting out like a five hour movie. Is that what happened? I totally buy into that. What I heard at the time was that he was under obligation to release something and he wasn't finished with the film. So he hurried up and released volume one and then volume two was kind of an afterthought. I'm not saying that's right. I was like 19 or 18 when this came out. That's just- gotcha. I, I, I just feel like it's like the other way around that I would say that volume two may feel a bit more rust compared to volume one. That it feels like you know like with the anime scene and everything else that it has and many different locations i just feel it's like this feels like they have like a lot of time for planning and the second one feels like just record just record i don't think i don't think that is the case i just think that they have like different vibe and that just makes them slightly different but at the same time i don't think that it's fair to talk about volume one without talking about volume two because it doesn't fair story and I am down to watch either one of these movies at any point of any time. So would I watch these movies again? Yes. I okay, we we are not there. But let's just <laughs> say that I I would be more open to watch one of these movies any day, you know, than the other. Let's just leave it at that. Uh but as this was my pick, do you want to summarize it? I do. Um all right, so this film follows essentially the bride, um, a character, an original character by Quentin Tarantino, played by Uma Thurman, and the film opens, it, correct me if I'm wrong, what? Sorry, isn't this like adapted from a short story? I have no idea. Is it? I think so. No other writing credits will be based on the character of the bride created by Quentin Tarantino, based on the character of the bride created by Uma Thurman. They created it together. Okay, then I may be completely wrong. Sorry for interrupting. No, you're fine. So uh, we open up in a black and white scene where Uma Thurman is on the floor of a church and she has clearly had the shit kicked out of her. And a man that we assume is Bill, but he's off camera starts talking to her in the beautiful prose of Gwen Tarantino and she whispers Bill the baby's you and then he shoots her in the head and we see her head explode or what we think is her head explode um the plot is not straightforward in terms of like a timeline but essentially the bride wakes up four years after this she's been in a coma um and she decides that she needs to go on a quote-unquote roaring rampage of revenge, and she creates a kill list of the five assassins that killed her. She was part of this assassin squad that was trained in martial arts, um, and they traveled the world killing people for money, um, and then at some point Bill got pissed off at her. We don't really know why exactly until I think probably volume two, um, but essentially we just watch her kill 
all five of these people over two films. The first one is Veronica Green, I think, whose codename was Copperhead, played by Vivica A. Fox. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's the first one. I find that one of the funniest scenes since uh, the bride was in the coma. Vivica A. Fox or uh, Veronica Green has become like a suburban housewife married to a dentist. And so they have this horrific knife fight in this suburban house. Um, and then after that, we go into. Oh, shoot. She doesn't immediately go to Oren Ishii, right? No, 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 no. It takes a while, you know. So basically, yeah, so she jabs... goes to Okinawa and yep. convinces. Um, what's his name? Matsumoto, who is a retired swords maker. To come Hansel, out of Hattori Hansel. Hattori, Hattori Hansel, who used to make weapons that kill. He since made a vow to God of peace, um, but she talks him out of that retirement to make a perfect Japanese sword because he actually trained Bill and he knows Bill's a piece of shit. And then we're introduced to her next victim, Oren Ishii, played by Lucy Liu, in an anime sequence where we find out how she became who she became. Um, and after the Viper Assassin spawn, that's the right name, broke up, she took over the Yakuza in Japan. And we kind of see how that happened. And then the big finale of volume one, she has a showdown with the Crazy 88, which is um, Oren Ishii's like personal what militia. Yeah. Um, and then she fights Oren Ishii. At that point, we move on to volume two, where she kills Bud, which is Bill's brother, and I can't remember the name of the guy who plays her. Michael Madsen. Michael Madsen. He kills Daryl. She kills Daryl. Well, she doesn't technically kill, kill Daryl Hannah, um, but we assume that she died after yeah. the Yeah, she's, she's, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. And ultimately, we're led to her final face off with Bill. And we find out at some, I think at the very end of volume one, that while she assumed her daughter died after she got shot in the head and went into a coma, her daughter did not die. And Bill had the daughter. And mm -hmm. we can guess what happens in that final showdown with Bill. Spoiler alert, 19 years later. <laughs> uh, one of the things, like, actually, the bride doesn't kill Bart. It's that it's Hannah who kills Bart. Oh, that's right. She doesn't kill Bud and she doesn't kill Daryl Hannah. Interesting. No. No. In the second movie, I think that the only main character that she actually kills is Bill. Surprise. <laughs> Anyone in the second movie? I'm pretty sure that she killed people, but I'm trying to think. Because there is like a lot of flashbacks and there is a like more character development, I could say, on the second movie compared to the first one. Like the pace is a bit slower. Like the first one is like a, a roller coaster of action, different settings and everything. And this one feels more like a calm western so we see like how she trained and she became such a martial artist with Padme yep. that is called Aim of the Master uh, we see the kind of life that Bat lives as a bouncer in a strip club a strip down club. the middle of nowhere that lives in a trailer yeah uh, yeah and I I think that that's like a bit more like on purpose but it's not like the same kind of pace. So there is not too many action scenes. Yep. On the second one. Yeah, it's completely different. Like, obviously the characters are the same, but if you were to look at tone and pacing, um, they're almost two completely different films. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think that that covers like what the movie is about. So... <laughs> Overall, how many times did you watch this movie? In my lifetime? I've watched Kill Bill Volume 1, uh, I don't know, probably 20, 25 times. I watched it three times in the last two weeks. Um, in fairness, I was on vacation on airplanes a lot, and it's a very rewatchable film. Um, I haven't seen Kill Bill Volume 2 nearly that many times, but probably at least six or seven times. Just sometimes, yeah. I think that probably I watch it. I'm not one for watching like the same thing over and over, 
but I would say that probably was like Kill Bill Volume One like five or six times, and Volume Two probably three or four. But yeah, it's interesting though because this is a very very memorable film. Like, uh, there's, I remembered almost everything about this, and yes, I've seen it a lot of times, but um, the story is just so memorable. I don't know how else to describe it. I just think that it's like really simple, you know, and it leaves your imagination. I don't know, it tickles your imagination, you know, it just spikes your imagination for the perspective that is that it doesn't give you everything. It just portrays a world where this kind of assassins, you know, that they look like a straight from the 70s, is that they are like a, a common currency or at least like something normal, because when she actually has that is seen when she's narrating how she discovered that she was pregnant. There is another like high level assassin. It makes you think is that there is a lot of these superhuman assassins around. Do you think this is in the universe of John Wick? I never was on Wick. <gasps> it's about like all of these like high powered assassins and they have their own bars and like, secret clubs and stuff. Uh, it's kind maybe. of the same. We say that as a joke, but it's like the world that Tarantino creates in this is like there's this secret world of just highly trained assassins that are fighting against each other and killing political leaders, and it's yeah. very fanciful, but so much fun. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's a at the same time it's pretty seventies. Is like it feels like out of time, but at the same time, timeless cool. Yeah. Yeah, and if, if you were to go to the IMDb page and check the, like, I think it's called the references page, like the number of times other films are referenced in this, the number is astronomical. Like the number of films he was like, oh, and I pulled this outfit from this film, and I pulled this sound from this film. It's basically an homage to martial arts films and like B films from the 70s. Maybe not B films, but you know, that like very stylized martial arts type of film from the 70s. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's fine to say like this series, you know, it's like it's not the movies that you actually are going to be like expecting to see in a list of the 10 best movies yeah. of the decade. You know, it's like I love, I mean, I love, I enjoy the Bruce Lee movies, but I don't think that they are elevated cinema, but they are super enjoyable to watch and i think that he went with like hey i'm going to be like taking an idea you know like a format about like this is how cinema used to do and he created something that is like way more than the sum of his parts way more. yeah i would agree with that like if you look just at volume one it's incredibly simple but and there's there's like a there's substance there's story and the characters are interesting but it's it shouldn't be as good as it is yeah yeah because it's true that it's like a, there is characters there is a story but the story is super simple is that you can just reduce it to a single sentence and the characters is a they give you a bit of background and they give you like a bit of a personality but i would say that except bill and the bride most of them they feel like a comic character is that this is the one line definition of your personality yeah they're characters like they're literally characters um like we never find out anything about daryl hannah well we get a little bit of insight about her own training with padme but nothing nothing yeah. beyond that and like, um, she's in some kind of relationship with bill they have pet names for each other. Like they allude to it. I don't know if, um, so for anyone listening that doesn't know, at maybe 10 years after this came out, Quentin Tarantino released in theaters only um, Kill Bill, The Whole Bloody Affair, which was as the film was originally intended to be, which was like five hours long. And it included a lot that was cut out from the original two films. So I don't know if that was kind of explored in the whole bloody affair or not, but it's not, we're not told for sure whether or not they're in a relationship. Yeah. And, uh, but in any case, it's like every single time that Terry Hannah is on the screen, it's like she embraces like that kind of, I'm a caricature, I'm like a comic character. It's like really over the top, you know, and really highly stylized character. Like when she goes to the hospital at the beginning and she's wearing like a patch with a cross, with a cross, like, 
dude, is that this is going to be like everything but subtle. You know, you're not merging with the situation at all. But it's super cool. Her legs stretched out and she pulls on the um, thigh high nylons. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but but it doesn't seem ridiculous when you're watching it. It works. Is like this is yeah. like the definition of cool. It's like I've never watched a movie that I feel like this is cool and it deserves to be cool. Is that there are like sometimes that you watch a movie and say like you're trying like really hard to be cool, like Driver. And also I um, so for someone like me, I know editing is important. The job of editors is really important, but. Tarantino has a longtime editor. Her name is Sally Menke. I don't know how to pronounce her name. It's either Menke or Menke. Um, you can see what editing can do to a pretty simple story in volume one. And you're like, holy crap, this is incredible. Like these yeah. cuts, sound effects, it's just, it's insane. Yeah, no, it's super engaging. And we talk about Tarantino many times about his movies. Usually it's like the script get you like super engaged. About like, even if it's like three hours, is like it's one of the few directors that I can watch like a two hours and a half movie and I'm going to be like checking my phone after five minutes after the first hour. And I just felt like this with this is that I I could rewatch it again, you know, like non-stop. Is that just bring it on. I can watch it again. I know I refresh all the quotes so I can actually like just even like do like some of the sentence along. Yeah, what the way he writes is it's just the way the word you described cool it's cool the way he writes the cultural references um he makes the performances he gets out of his actors like uma thurman is not a leading lady but the performance the performances he can get out of her that's like the definition of synergy right like she's like quentin and numa it's like a match made in heaven or hell i don't know but i love it do you think that she's not material for leading lady? I mean, if you look at any other film where she was the lead, she's not. She doesn't spark like she does in a Tarantino film. That's for sure. Gataka. I mean, she's fine, but she's not the leading. I mean, she plays a leading part, but she doesn't carry the entire movie. You know what I mean? Like, she's not the primary star. Ethan Hawke is. That's fair. I mean, she was great in Nymphomaniac. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's not a leading role. But she had like five lines. I mean, she pulled it off. But if she had to play... Um... Crap, I can't think of her name. Who played the lead in Nymphomaniac? The British-French actress. Oh, yeah. Uh, Charlotte Ramping? Uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg. <laughs> You'll get it. You'll get it one day. Uh, she couldn't have done what Charlotte Gainsbourg was asked to do. <sighs> uh, okay. No, that that may be fair. That may be fair. I'm just sad about like, just thinking about Emma Thurman. is an actress that I really like, and I always think that Hollywood didn't treat her as well as it could because she's not traditionally pretty. And that's why she was one of the men that the serial killer in the house that Jack built, Lars von Trier, Lars von Trier killed brutally. Oh God, I haven't watched it yet. And I don't know if I really want to watch it after everything that I got about the movie. It's completely forgettable in my opinion. But if you want to watch Lars von Trier take out his frustrations on women for like two more hours, like in every film, you can watch him do it to like seven women in this one film. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't see the value for that. Um, so we can agree. I mean, I, I, if I had to think about like volume one, I think that is like one of the best cinematic experiences, at, at least like the most enjoyable cinematic experiences. Is like he just tries to distill down like so many aspects of classic cinema, well, classic cinema, all cinema, you know, and just put it through his prism that everything is like just cool and super tight. Is like he has like amazing fight scenes. You can rewatch it as many times as you want. It's like I don't think that he ever gets old. There are like a lot of details. Everything is like super, super 
detailed, you know, like super, how do you say, like uh, treated with care. There are even like some scenes like when they are fighting on the restaurant, you know, with the 88 maniacs, and they go into the other room, and it's like they actually change into a complete different stage that is like all blue, and you only see the shadows. And I feel it's like, this is highly stylized. There is nothing like this in this movie, and it fucking works. It doesn't and feel pretentious. Like, it feels cool. That scene is over the top violent, but it's like pretty dramatic, right? And then when the lights finally turn back on, there's this moment of humor where there's this like young 88 that has to be like 15, maybe 14 years old, and she starts spanking him with her sword and saying, Go home to your mother. And like there are these moments of humor in between these moments of like intense violence and um I, it's just impressive with like how many genres or moments of genres he can fit in seamlessly yeah. in the film. Yeah, and I also want to call out like the like the music selection is incredible. Is that all of the music is like there is almost a song on every single scene. There are like moments where he actually uses like the negative sound. That is like for example like that I see where they are like fighting on this shadowy room, there is no room. There is no there is no music on the background. And as there was like music playing like the whole time, it feels like way more shocking, way more ominous compared to what was happening before. So I just felt is that this is incredible, is that the soundtrack is amazing. He knows when to use it well and when not to use it. And it's super recognizable. So I bought the soundtracks to both volume one and volume two. And I can't remember if it was on both soundtracks or only on one, but there were like 30 or 40 tracks of the sound effects that they used. So like the swords going swoosh, 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 or like blood splattering. And there's just these individual sound effects. And I was like, oh God, this is all so cool. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's like such a attention level that is like, hey, look, maybe in the 70s is that they will used to have, you know, they maybe they have like 100 special effects that they would reuse in all of the movies of the same studio. I'm pretty sure that this guy did an investigation, whoever was like the sound specialist, for just like checking all of those sounds and just like manually select each one of them here. And they're over the top and absurd and it works perfectly. Yes. And I don't understand how he can do that. I don't get it. Well, because it's at the end, it's a complete homage to that kind of movies. So it's like we mentally associate like one thing with the other, but he does it in such a elaborated, cool way. And there is a, a the special effects is that this is not like a very, I don't know, it's not like a CGI movie. There is almost no CGI. In the 90s, there were a group of directors that came to prominence, um, including Quentin Tarantino. Uh, I think David Fincher, Steven Soderbergh, I could be wrong, but they were all these directors that did not go to film school, but they just grew up watching VHSs and that's how they learned to make film. And I've always admired that from Quentin Tarantino because if he had learned like formal film theory, maybe we wouldn't have Kill Bill, but because he just watched uh, like martial arts films from the 70s over and over and over, like we, we have this amalgamation of film history in a very, very cool, updated, timeless, kind of roaring rampage of revenge tale. Yeah. And that's like the part that then when I go to was like volume two, you know, I just feel disappointed because it's like you don't have that kind of frantic feeling. You don't have like this music that is like helping you like carry the scenes. It becomes like way more quiet as a movie. Is that there is barely no music compared with the first volume. Yeah, and it breaks my heart to move on to talk about volume two because volume two is just like a pretty good movie. Like, it's, it's better than most, but it's not like exceptional, I wouldn't say. I could say, imagine that is a Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction, as well as say like Pulp Fiction. It has like just an incomplete story and it gets completed with Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown is not a bad movie. It's not a bad movie. But Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs are significantly better movies. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, I don't disagree. Yeah, and having to wait like for a year, I remember like back then, like just leaving the cinema, like, I, I don't know how I'm going to survive for a year. I honestly don't know how I'm going to be like just waiting for a year for just knowing how this ends. And then when the second one came out, I just felt it's like, 
this didn't happen. This, this, this didn't happen. I mean, I didn't feel like I hated it, but I felt like in the last part, you know, with Bill, I think that is really good. I think that the Padme training is pretty good, but it's missing that vibe, that frantic vibe that, you know, like, I don't know, like super cool and super well care style and atmosphere of the movie. It felt like not really Russ, but it's like you're trying to do like something different. Is that you already set up like the ground for this? Is that you don't need to change it? Yeah, I I don't disagree. I mean, I feel like I feel like any film that is going to be compared to Kill Bill Volume One is set up for failure. Um, but yeah, all the things we were just talking about that we loved about Volume One, they're basically missing from Volume Two. And I would say that the the final standoff between the bride and Bill is not even that satisfying. Like if you compare it to like the the ultimate scene with mm. Oren Ishii of Volume One and how like, epic it was, I just the, the whole thing is a bit of a letdown. If you were to take away Volume One, I would say Volume Two is a good. It's a it's a pretty good film, but it yeah. just doesn't compare. Do you feel like maybe he did it like a bit on purpose about like a like revenge is something that you know people may look up to, but maybe it's never as rewarding. As, I don't you think she's a okay. forward thinker. <laughs> I respect what you're saying. Like, oh, it was purposeful. He wanted us to be disappointed by the sa- the revenge. No, he wanted us to be so satisfied. Yeah, no, and that's the part is like, I love the dialogue, you know, like with Bill. But I remember, I think that I told you that I used to go to a to a bar when it was uh, back in Coruña, and uh, the uh, the owner of the bar he used to recommend me like you know like movies to watch. And we're talking about like Tarantino and other directors, and he always was like, I don't really like Tarantino because he does movies for himself, and he thinks that he's smarter on his script than he actually is. And we're talking about Kill Bill, and he was telling me, like, look, the action, whatever, you know, but it's like, what dialogue can you actually defend on this movie? And I remember like just saying, he's like, well, the last dialogue with Bill, you know, is like, it's the classic dialogues that you will find in Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, you know? And he was telling me, is like, that conversation about superheroes, what is the point of it? How is it helping, like, a story progressing? You know, is that just giving us, like, some kind of character building 30 seconds before that character is dead? I mean, if you're going to, like, compare the dialogue of Kill Bill Volume 1 and Volume 2 compared to Reservoir Dogs, yeah, it's not as, like, mind-blowing, for sure. I think the star of the show is the action and the dialogue kind of takes a little bit of a backseat to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have me thinking about... Because, yeah, there's not, like, the interesting conversation, like, at the beginning of Reservoir Dogs about tipping, which we all <laughs> love. Everyone loves that. <laughs> I love so much. I don't believe in tipping. <laughs> <laughs> um... But still, it's not like the dialogue is is uninspired in Volume One or Volume Two. It's it's good. It's there. Yeah. It's just not as as front and center stage. And it's weird because usually I could say that the screenwriting is what is like one of the main strengths of Tarantino. And on this one, is like he sacrificed it for a bit more of a the style on volume one and i think that in volume two is that he couldn't actually like just like hey now i'm going to be like a bit more on character development you know and i think that the world that he depicts is so far off from our own that i don't think that it has the same gravitas that it could have you know in other movies like reservoir dogs or or fiction and in fairness this film is an homage to martial arts films of the 70s i would be willing to bet that dialogue isn't front and center in those films either. So he was staying true to the source material. True, but the problem is like when you actually put so much strength of your second movie into it, is like it's not going to be like paying off. You are not going to be like bringing the end result to the elevated level. The first one, and it's funny because it's like I think that the first volume is more elevated than the second one. And there is so many limbs. There is even a quote about like, if you're still alive, you can leave, but leave your limbs behind. They belong to me. 
<laughs> that's in volume one, and that's amazing. It's in volume one, and it's fucking amazing. It's like, that's a quote that is like, I have like recorded on my brain, and I think this is more elevated than volume two. And correct me if I'm wrong, but she says all that shit in Japanese, and we read the yeah. subtitles. Yeah. yeah. It's so fucking cool. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, I'm thinking specifically about the narration of the anime sequence where we see uh, Oren Ishii as a child. Like, the narration's super cool. Yeah. Like, the dialogue is good. It's just, again, it's not the primary focus. Like we were saying, Reservoir Dogs could be a play. Kill Bill could not be a play. Oh, no. No. Uh, this is a bit more like a... I would say that that's a bit more like the storytelling is good. You know? Yes. The narration. But it's like, it's not the dialogues, per se. It's not yes. the characters. Because as we said, it's that they're like just tools for the story. You know, it's like a tools. compelling comic book. Correct. Yeah, and it's that's great. I mean, this is like probably the best comic book movie ever that is not basing any comic book. I agree completely. Yeah. And I just think it's like when you set like the ground in this kind of way in volume one, then just trying to go back to your other style about like I'm going to be like making it a bit more pause. And I think that volume two is like more pause than Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. Definitely, it's way slower. Way slower. Yeah. yeah, and I'm trying to think. Is like I think that it's way slower than any other movie after that too. So I'm gonna be honest. I've only seen half of the hateful eight. Or the hateful eight. What? Uh, yeah, I never finished it. Oh, you didn't yeah, like it too much. All his... So after that, he did Death Proof, which. Eh. Uh, no, it's fast. <laughs> Then Inglorious Bastards, Django Unchained, The Hateful Eight, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, I would say of all those, Kill Bill Volume One or Volume Two is definitely the slowest in terms of pacing and tone. Yeah, and it's weird because he actually just makes it as a follow-up of the movie that I think is the most frantic one. Death Proof, you're saying, is the most frantic one? No, I mean like uh, the Kill Bill Volume Two. Is just like the follow-up to oh, the most true. frantic movie, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and that's like the part that feels like it makes this contrast even bigger, you know, and it doesn't, I don't think that Tarantino excels when it's, when he plays like this slow stuff. I'm, I'm making it my personal mission to get my hands on a copy of The Whole Bloody Affair, even if it's an illegal copy, so that we can see the actual, like, complete vision of what he intended. Because I do think that the story itself suffered from being separated. For whatever reason, I don't know what the real reason is, into two di different volumes, I want to see it in a single volume. I think that one of the things that they changed, or the main thing that they changed that is interesting for that, is that uh, they don't disclose that the daughter is alive at the end of Volume 1. They don't? They don't. At that point in the story? Yeah, and it would be way more compelling if that was like a surprise. Like, even if it, if, if it was at the beginning of the third act, instead of like halfway through the film, it would still be like... <gasps> yeah. No, but just instead of, hey, we want to make sure you see volume two next year. But it's a look after watching like two hours and 20 minutes of the most glorious action, you know, is do I need to know that the daughter is alive? Is this what it's going to be? Yeah. You know, I thought that it's like, okay, that's a motivator for starting your revenge or just like being more convinced. But the moment that you met Thurman, you know, like the bride actually sees the daughter alive and she breaks down, it would be like way more impactful if you didn't know that it was going to be alive. Yeah, if the, the when she opened the door to the hacienda to kill Bill, if that was the moment, I would my jaw would have hit the floor. I would be yeah. like, I did not see that coming. Yeah. Um, and there is no other, the thing is that there is no other mention to the door. Yeah, I mean, so when we see her wake up in the hospital, we we see her clutch her stomach and she says something about my daughter, but that's the only other reference in my... Mm. No, I mean, I mean like from the daughter being alive. We don't have like any other indication that the daughter is alive. Oh yeah, just that final scene where she's talking to Sophie in the trunk. Which, by the way, we didn't mention the, the death of Sophie. Or I guess Sophie didn't die, but what happens to Sophie is like, chef's kiss. It's so good. 
<laughs> I don't know why I thought that she actually lost all her limbs. I don't think so, because when she rolls, the bride rolls her down. It has like legs, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so probably she lost her, her, her arms. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is seen. God, I mean, the whole first movie, that is seen with uh, Osher Rizzi, with Lucy Liu. That is a, a, this is a blatant copy of Lady Snowblood. Yeah, I, when, when you had me watch Lady Snowblood, I couldn't believe how I was like, oh, it's almost like shot for shot. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't say like in a bad way. I'm saying it's like, yeah, yeah. look, you got like something because Lady Snowblood was super cool, like, stylistically cool, you know, and it's a movie from what, like 73 or something, Japanese. Yep. There is a Criterion Collection edition, I think, but it's like, it's not like the kind of movie that if you talk with a random person on the street will know. And it's like, it's super cool. He actually took like that scene, that story of revenge. It also feels like partially from there because there was also like a character. It would be almost like if the daughter was the one like looking for revenge, not the mother. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of similarities. Um, I don't know. I love it. And I'm con conflicted because volume two is not that good compared to volume one. It's not, not any sex. Yeah. I mean, not any sex. Not that the movie sex is a bit more about like having these higher expectations. And I assume that you also went to the cinema to watch it, no? I did person? not. So when Volume One and Volume Two came out, I was living in Eastern Europe and was prohibited from watching films. So by the time I saw both films, it was on DVD, and I saw them at the same time. Yeah, for me, I actually went to the cinema. I, I, from the first trailer, it's like me and another friend of mine in college we were like super hype i remember like just talking with him like all the time and i remember a friend of us like saying like why are you guys so excited it's just a movie i remember like saying like no no jose and me we like good movies and this is going to be a good movie i remember it, you know it's like that thing is like you go like completely my head is like yes we do bitch yes we do <laughs> so you were you were what let me let me do the math night so you're like 23 when this came out yeah okay yeah i was in college i was finishing college at the time yeah yeah probably like volume two it was already like done with college um and yeah i i don't even remember who did i go to watch it with i only remember like the first one like <gasps> Like just being like in, in an orgasm, yeah, like <laughs> jerking off in the background. <laughs> Let's say climaxing, you know, without any kind of help. Like, uh, uh, but yeah, it's interesting. Like watching it, like every single time that I watch it, I always think this, this is not going to be as good. I always have like the same feeling with Reservoir Dogs. You know, that is like knowing the gist of it is the things that like, this is not going to be that good. And this is like, no, holy shit, this is this is as good as I remember, or even better. If I can actually watch it for like one more time and I still feel it as fresh. See, I never have that feeling with Reservoir Dogs or Kill Bill, either volume, but I always have that with Pulp Fiction. Don't judge me. I haven't seen Pulp Fiction in probably 10, 15 years, and I'm like, do I really want to spend three hours watching this? It's not going to be as good as I remember. I know, I believe you, but like rationally, I understand. Emotionally, I'm like, eh. I think that I watched it, Pulp Fiction, and we still have to watch it, but it's like, I watched it again like two or three years ago, you know, like before we started with the podcast, I think, and I think that I brought you at the end of the movie, is like, dude, I was meaning to write you for the whole movie, for telling you that it's impossible to pull away my, my eyes from this, and I couldn't do it until the movie was over. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to rewatch it on my own time, outside of podcast homework. <laughs> But, but we can also watch it for the podcast. We can, we can. Yeah, because the same way that we actually did like a lot of David Lynch, is that maybe it's time that we actually cover the caps for Tarantino? Well, we better start with four rooms. <laughs> did he really direct that part? But it was Robert Rodriguez. No, no, there were four directors and he directed a fourth. Robert Rodriguez directed a fourth. Each room was a different director, but Quentin Tarantino got more credit because he was the big star of the 90s, so... Okay, okay. I thought that he actually just helped with the direction. And, uh, and Robert Rodriguez was the one. Yeah, but no, you're right. Yeah, one of them. Okay. Uh, should we go over the questions? Yes, uh, 
but so we're only going to ask one set of questions and give one score right. overall the entire both films combined so the single story yeah and i we discussed about this like before we uh, started the recording and it sucks honestly it's like i'm also like a bit conflicted but i don't think that it's fair to talk about Q build volume one without considering it like part of a larger story it's not it's not even like a star wars dude it's not even like a star wars this is like, okay you see episode four and you can just forget the rest is that this without volume two is completely open all right if you say so <laughs> you just want to give it a 10 to volume one let's be honest <laughs> Uh, okay, man. So, would you would you watch them again? One hundred percent. I would watch Kill Bill Volume One again right now. No, 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 no. But would you watch it alone, Volume Two? Yes. Okay. Okay. I I will watch them. Again. I think, as I told you, that I enjoy way more uh, Volume One than Volume Two. But I don't think that Volume Two is a bad movie by any means. It's, I think. It's still like an enjoyable watch, an enjoyable movie to watch. Would you recommend them? Yes, without hesitation to almost anyone. In fact, I can't think of a situation where I wouldn't, except maybe my 12-year-old niece, but that's it. I wouldn't recommend it to my... I think that if it was like playing on the TV, I think that I would recommend it to my parents, because there is no like too much sex, there is violence, but it's like so... Cartoony. Stylized, but it's yeah. Not. Yeah. Is it? I cannot take this seriously. It's like this is like over the top fun. Uh, would you remember it? Yes. In fact, just before we started recording, I was telling you like it's bizarre how much of this film is easily remembered. Even if you haven't seen it for ten years, you remember all the characters, basically what happens, a lot of the dialogue. It's a very, very memorable film. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was surprised about like how much I remember, you know, like so many of the quotes, so many of the specific, you know, like snippets that it was like, yeah, it's something that it just gets stuck in your brain. Uh, is there anything artistic about it? Hell yeah. The direction, the writing, the acting, the editing, all of the music. It's all fucking, yeah. The music is all artistic, even volume two. It's artistic as fuck. The scene where Daryl Hannah goes to the uh, to the hospital to kill the bride, that is scene is like it gives me goosebumps. It's like I think that there are those two three minutes, you know, like with the music, the uh, the editing, you know, like splitting like the screen and everything is like is perfect. It's like I think that is like one of the best sequences that I ever seen in any movie. So like in two thousand three, there was a remix not a remix there was like a dance song that featured that yeah that was so popular in eastern europe was that like was that popular in spain i think that it was somewhat popular was i remember like this yeah i remember like just disliking it from the perspective is like you don't use this <laughs> this is sacred but, but it was pretty impressive the, the influence that scene had like, yeah. it was everywhere it almost feels you know like how well fit the music is you know like the Nancy Sinatra song like my baby shoot me down uh -huh. it almost feels like it almost feels like you thought about like some of these songs and then you wrote the script that it could fit perfectly into this and I don't blame him if that's what he did because it was perfect the execution was yeah he's like a this is the definition of cool so artistic 100 percent. is it a timeless piece yes completely nothing this else to add no, no it's just this will be as good as it was this year in 2050 as it was in 2003 when it came out it's just no it's excellent yeah, yeah i mean you can see that there are like some aged details you know about like the phone and everything but everything is so detached from time that is like yeah it's a home maze to 70s so it's like if you go back in time and you go to the 50s and you show this to someone they're going to be like what the fuck am i watching <laughs> but i think that anyone in the future you know like a kid in the 
2040s that they haven't ever watched a 70s movie and they don't know that this is like a homage to that kind of cinema, they will still enjoy it. I think that anyone, regardless of the knowledge of that time, of the cinema of that time, they will find this really cool and really enjoyable. Agreed. Uh, would you turn this into a TV show? Absolutely not. I, this is just perfect. As perfect as it can be, I wouldn't change this at all. Uh, besides whatever the whole bloody affair looks like, but I would not turn yeah. it into a TV show. <laughs> it's funny that we're going to be like disagreeing so much into this, but this is like one of the few movies that I really, really, really like that I think that it will work amazing as a TV show because I think that there is like a world building an implicit world building here that I would love to hear more about I would love to hear more about like the cases you know I would even like love to have like a, a spin-off TV show with Lucy Liu as an international that's true I would like to know more about the characters like I would like to figure out how Bud went from one of the most deadly assassins in the world to living in a trailer park in the desert like how does that like there's clearly stories and uh, Tarantino cut out a lot from the original script we know he built out the world even further um, yeah. so there is more I'd like to learn I just don't want to see HBO turn this into like an 8 episode miniseries I could have mine no, sorry. I think that I would mind that if it was only like a eight episode TV show. I wouldn't mind like something like Better Call Saul about like, hey, we're going to have like seven seasons with 12 episodes each, you know, and we're going to be like doing whatever the fuck <laughs> we want with it. He said, like, yes, I want more. I want more of this world. You're going to turn this into The Office with like 10 seasons, 24 <laughs> episodes each. <laughs> and then in one of the seasons, they replace like Lucy Liu with. I don't know. Another <laughs> Asian actress, like whatever. Yeah, it's always good to realize. Yeah. Somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but a bit more of a project with a beginning and an end on mine, and just expanding like this universe. I think that it will work like amazingly well. I'm gonna keep my answer a no, but I totally see how that could work. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be interesting. What do you think that these movies could have been better? I do. I from I did not see the whole bloody affair, but from what I hear, it really brought the whole story together. Um, so even though I think these are great films, I do think there was probably an opportunity to keep the story as a single film. I, I can't point to a single thing that I would improve. Besides, I would like to see the the pacing match the pacing of volume two match closer to volume one. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And it, that's my main kind of concern about this, you know. Uh, I think that it could have felt more congruent, you know, yeah. like from a stylistic perspective or from a narrative perspective, from a base perspective, like both volumes. Not saying that it's a deal breaker because they're like freaking enjoyable, but this is still what we're saying. It's like the back to back, as you watch it, is they probably was even like more soggy. Yeah, was there's a huge difference. Yep. Yeah. Uh, cool. Before we score this, uh, who's this? Oh yeah, last time you actually asked me about Krubus. Uh I think that it was Krubus. But what do you remember? <laughs> what do you remember about a stalker? Um, I remember that it's basically like a Pulp Fiction kind of like housewife book that Tarkovsky turned into cheap sci-fi. No, no, a stalker. Not a stalker. A stalker. S-T-O-K-E-R. Oh, I thought you said, okay, got it. Um, Mia Wasikowska is the psychopathic daughter of uh, what's her name? Tom Cruise's ex. Nicole Kidman. Her father dies and um, her father's brother, so her uncle, but not Nicole Kidman's brother, that mm -hmm. she's never met or hasn't seen in a long time comes to town for her brother's funeral, or for, her, for his brother's funeral. Um, and he strikes up an inappropriate relationship with Nicole Kidman and an inappropriate relationship with Mia Wasikowska that borders on 
incest, although it doesn't ever quite cross the line, but it becomes clear that they're both psychopaths and they plan on running away together to be psychopaths together. But in true psychopath style, on their way out of town, she just shoots him in the face and then runs away. I I completely forgot in the end. That's pretty impressive. You really remember it. I only remember this movie because uh, last Halloween I was in a party and we're talking about cinema and someone says, oh yeah, we're going to be like watching this movie called Stalker. And I asked them to spell it. He's like, the Tarkovsky one? The roadside picnic adaptation? And he actually said that. And he mentioned something about it. It has Nicole Kidman. I had the feeling that it was this. And it started like just clicking on my brain, like all of the details, and it was like, just do something else with your life. <laughs> I I asked you to watch that. When I saw it in theaters, I really liked it. When we rewatched it, I was like, eh, I could take it or leave it. Like I I, I found it entertaining, but I wouldn't recommend it. Like at this point. Yeah, I mean, you give it a hate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not watch it again. We can just no. like, leave it as it is. Yeah. Uh, but again, okay, so we score Kill Bills. Yes. Yes, uh, so this was your pick. I so scored. just go first. Yeah. I was going to give um vol- if we were gonna do it separately, I was gonna give volume one a nine point five and I was gonna give the volume two a seven point five. So I'm just gonna meet in the middle and give it an eight point five, even though that breaks my fucking heart because volume one deserves better. <laughs> yeah. Uh I was like between also like an 8.5 and a 9, you know, but it's like just being fair from the perspective of how much of a letdown volume 2 was. Not saying that it's bad, just saying that it was a letdown. Just a comparison. Uh, I'm just going to go also with an 8.5. And a what? An 8.5. Oh, okay. I thought you said 9.5 for a second. I I get to score this higher than (laughs) No, that's fair. And I, uh, you were telling me that you think that uh, Volume 1 is like a masterpiece. I don't disagree. I think it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, uh. That being said, I, I admit I need to watch Pulp Fiction again. Okay. I, I love Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction a lot. And I love Kill Bill Volume 1. I just think that it's, a, it's interesting to see the Reservoir Dogs amazing, Pulp Fiction amazing, Jackie Brown, good. Yeah. And then just doing like Kill Bill Volume 1 that is like, this is fucking amazing, okay? And then from that point, I just feel everything is a bit more like hit or miss. Agreed. Death Proof, eh, it was fun. Yeah. Not like a great film. Um, yeah. Hateful Eight didn't see Inglorious Bastards. Eh. And then... I watched it again like recently and it was sad. There are a couple of really yeah. good scenes, but eh, overall. Eh. But once upon a time, once upon a time in Hollywood, I really, really enjoyed that film. So yes, since Kill Bill Volume One, hit or miss. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I used to think that this is like of a moment of brilliance that Tarantino had at the beginning of his career, you know. And I think that right now he's still like one of the most interesting directors out there. But. Yeah, when we say hit or miss, hit or miss for Quentin Tarantino, which is light years ahead of the vast majority of directors' work. <laughs> yeah, definitely this is not like a Michael Bay hit or miss situation, or a James Cameron hit or miss situation. <laughs> or and David I love... Lynch. Yeah, or David Lynch hit or miss. But uh, we're talking about like, someone that I think that the lowest that I could score one of his movies is like a 7.5. Yep, agreed. So, uh, but in any case, what are we watching this? We're going to watch Crash. Oh, you mean like the Oscar Oscar winner? winner. (laughs) Not the Oscar winning Crash. The 1996 David Cronenberg. I don't even think it's body horror. It's it's like, uh, it's not body horror. Body fetish? Body fetish genre. um, About this, I think it's a reporter who, like, after being in a car crash, he kind of descends into this subculture of omnisexuals who get off on, like, scars and stuff. So, I'm super looking forward to watch it. Me too. I haven't seen this movie in a long time, and it's NC-17, which I don't think we re- reviewed an NC-17 film on this podcast before. We review Sorbas. If that was not a NC-17. <laughs> 
think just they stopped giving the NC-17 rating out. Now Netflix is like, yeah, we'll show cock. It's fine. <laughs> well, no, on that we actually see like way more. That's a porn in disguise, dude. <laughs> did we review the idiots on this podcast? Yes, we did. All right. Okay, so this is not <laughs> the most explicit. <laughs> we review like some very explicit shit in this podcast. Let's just leave it there. Which is why we don't talk about this at work. <laughs> no, not much, at least. Okay, man. Uh, this was a really good conversation. Uh, I was looking forward to actually having this, you know? Yeah, I think we were both a little bit nervous about it because we've seen this film so many times. And what were we going to say about this? But yeah, it was a good conversation. Good. Good. Nice. Cool. All right, man. Uh, to everyone else out there listening to us, thank you so much for your patience, for putting up with us. Anything else that they should do? And wash your hands, guys. Just keep doing it. Yeah, why not? Okay. Bye. <laughs>